Hello, welcome back to Ask a Woman. I'm delighted to have today one of the few women in modern history to become a national leader. She was also quite possibly the first woman in internet history to go viral when she made a speech in the Australian Parliament in 2012 calling out misogyny. I bet you remember it. And it was recently voted the most unforgettable moment in Australian TV history. And there was some competition, it has to be said. Since she left the job in 2013, she channeled her energy into campaigning for girls' education around the world. She is chair of the Global Partnership for Education. And among many other projects, she is also the inaugural chair of the Global Institute for Women's Leadership at King's College here in London. I'm delighted to welcome yeah. Julia Gillard. It's great to be here. Really lovely to see you. I mean, we'll talk about this, uh, you know, major piece of work that you've been doing around girls' education, but I suppose almost every interview begins with that moment, doesn't it? <laughs> Ten years ago, you became, became the first female PM in Australia, and that moment when you called them out for misogyny, wow. <laughs> uh, I get asked about it a lot. Uh, I get asked about it in media interviews, that speech. I also have women sort of run up to me in the street, including here in London, to talk about that speech. Actually, there's people stop you in the street about it. Literally, sometimes dri diving through traffic to have a conversation. I'm like, careful, careful, careful. Uh, but. I think uh, one of the reasons it's still like that is that that speech has come to represent for many women the thing that they wish they'd said at a given moment. So I think every woman's life has sexism in it, a moment when she wished she'd come back with the, you know, perler of a one line, <laughs> uh, and the speeches come to represent something for women in that moment. And did you have any sense of its impact when you when you were so fired up delivering those lines? No, no. I mean, it was a speech given in a particular political context. I mean, in the, you know, House of Representatives in Australia, you can see the opposition, you're quite close to them physically. And so I knew that it was a powerful <laughs> speech. I could see the change in the body language of those opposite, but I had no idea uh, that all of these years later I would still be talking about it. And it does feel um, sort of a piece of, you know, women's history almost. When you look back, especially since the uh, conviction of Harvey Weinstein um, last week, of course, you know, it feels there was your speech, there's been the Me Too movement, there's been this great galvanisation of women around a new wave of feminism. It does sort of feel as if it was part of that recent history of feminism, really. Well, that's very flattering of you to say so, and I, I hope that's true. Uh, I certainly think it brought the word misogyny uh, back into more parlance <laughs> than uh, had been. I think one of the dictionaries actually moved the definition of misogyny after my speech. And I do think we've got to be talking about the full range of barriers that present against women and girls. And that does um, include unconscious barriers, it includes structural barriers, but sometimes it does include misogyny too. And uh, here in the UK, in so many places around the world, we've seen women who are in the public square just the subject to so much vile social media threats. You know, we do have to be calling that out and trying to end it. Yeah, it's certainly something, as you will well know from having been here and backwards and forwards to the UK, that we've certainly experienced in the last few months. Um, we'll perhaps talk about that a, a little more later. But your real focus for campaigning on education has focused on girls in particular since you left office as Prime Minister. Um, it's one of those issues that occasionally pops up on the political agenda, but we always know gets pushed down when there's the next crisis. Well, it's true, but I do feel a bit like the gathering energy around this wave of feminism, that there's now more of a continuing focus on girls' education. I mean, Prime Minister Boris Johnson here has referred to girls' education as the Swiss army knife uh, in development. You know, it's the one thing that you can do which will make a difference to economic opportunity, to health status, to climate change, to peace and security. And I think all of that body of evidence means people are more prepared now to invest and invest in a continuing way. But I want to continue to use my voice to say, look, we're doing good work and the Global Partnership for Education, which I chair, can point to more than 40 million more girls in school, but there are 130 million more girls to go. So let's keep lifting effort. And, and it's fair to say that girls are affected disproportionately badly. Uh, compared to boys in conflict situations in particular? Yes, it is. And if you were wanting to summon up in your mind's eye the face of a child most likely to miss out on education, it would be a girl's face. 
I've seen this in Lebanon, actually, with the refugee crisis there. I know it's something that you've spoken about before. And there are models that work. Lebanon has sort of stretched its facilities to have double shifts in schools to make sure that the refugee children, of which there are hundreds of thousands there, get a chance. But it just cannot reach all of them. Yeah, it does call on us to really think about innovative models that still gets education through. I mean, at the moment, we're obviously all talking about coronavirus, uh, and it does remind me of the last, you know, epidemic we were talking about was Ebola. And in those very desperate circumstances in places like Liberia and Sierra Leone, uh, GPE did help the Global Partnership for Education uh, by putting educational content on the radio. So so that kids could be at home because schools were closed, but at least getting some learning happening and some normality in their day because a lot of the impact of the crisis is just the loss of the known. You know, you used to go to school, now you're at home. What do you do with your day? How do you think about it? How anxious do you feel about the epidemic yourself as a child? And to just have the voice of your teacher or a teacher on the radio made a real difference. So what, I mean, that seems like a very practical response Response. What fundamentally works in situations where kids have been deprived of an education, when they're on the move and survival is the priority, really, rather than books and learning? Well, if you ask the children themselves, though, yes, of course, if uh, children haven't eaten, if they're displaced, if they're on the move, if there's a problem with access to clean water, I mean, the things that sustain life have to be dealt with. But once you have food and water, if you ask the children themselves, the thing that they want is to be in school. Um, they know uh, that, you know, if they miss out on education, then that's going to make a difference for the rest of their lives. And there there is that, you know, sense of rhythm about it. Uh, so you just imagine everything that you ever knew about your world is gone to have somewhere to go to with other children, to be doing learning activities. There's a reassurance in that and children very much crave that reassurance. But I suppose it's one of those issues that you're always playing catch up with towards the latest crisis. I mean, look at what's just happening in Syria currently around Idlib with this huge, sudden, another surge of people fleeing their homes with no certain future or destination. How, how quickly can you actually mobilise to help these kids? Well, we uh, work at the Global Partnership for Education in uh, almost 70 developing countries, so it's a very big global footprint. About half of those countries experience conflict or fragility, so we are used to making assistance available in an emergency way. We also work very strongly with an organisation called Education Cannot Wait and with the United Nations High Commissioner for Refugees to try and make sure that no matter the circumstances, whether the kids are in refugee camps, whether they've been immediately displaced over a national border, whether they're displaced within their own country, that we're doing everything we can to uh, ensure that there's learning opportunities. And at the same time, we're trying to build up education systems right around the world. Uh, many of the children who miss out are not um, outside their home communities. They're in their home communities, but there's no school to go to or no school that can offer quality education. And we're you know, very focused on working with governments to strengthen whole education systems, knowing that that will make the biggest difference to the most at risk children, particularly the girls. And, and that's quite a lot like work's paid off pretty effectively in primary school level, particularly. Yes, it has. We can see across the time that we've been at this and the Global Partnership for Education uh, started in the early 2000s. We can see that we've made a big difference. Uh, so, for example, in GPE countries, through Three out of four girls are finishing primary school. That is a sea change from when we started. Uh, we know that there are millions of kids now getting to go to lower secondary school who weren't able to go before, but there's more to do and we're hungry to accelerate the pace of change. The United Kingdom has been a fantastic partner for us. It's our longest term and largest bilateral donor, but we do want to seize this moment when the Prime Minister is so focused on girls education to say, let's all lift another stage. You faced some criticism when you were PM for reintroducing the detention camps uh, when you were dealing with the refugee boats that were coming over from Indonesia. They, they were tough times for you in office, a lot of criticism on that front, and there were children 
put in those detention camps. What lessons or regrets do you have from that period when you were in charge of that policy? Yeah, look, it's a, a very difficult policy area. I mean, certainly education was provided uh, for asylum seeker children. Uh, so in terms of, you know, continuity of learning, we made sure that we were focused on that. Uh, the issue for Australia is uh, people try and make what is an incredibly dangerous journey uh, from Indonesia uh, to the Australian mainland or to Christmas Island or Ashmore Reef, which are part of Australia but out, you know, offshore. Um, and people lose their lives doing that. It's an incredibly unsafe stretch of water. And so you have to balance uh, how you're going to send a message to people that really, whatever the people smuggler is trying to say to you, your likelihood of surviving this journey um, is, you know, it's a very, very risky choice that you're about to make. But the ones who were picked up were put into those camps. I mean, that is a, that is a tough call and a tough stance on asylum. Uh, and a refugee status. I mean, is there, are there are times when you look back on that and think, if only there'd been another way for those children in particular? Uh, I, you want every child, obviously, to have the best possible opportunity in life. But uh, we were very concerned that if there was a message sent through the people smuggling pipeline, uh, that you could get to Australia and that was it, that more and more people would be dying at sea because they would be risking the journey. And that trade-off was sort of worth we, it in your view? We increased our refugee intake. Um, so uh, we were trying to show compassion, uh, get more refugees into Australia, but not through that mechanism of having risked the sea voyage. Mm. Tough, tough call though. I mean, is it something that you still think about? Oh, I, you know, I'm going to think about, uh, you, of course, you think about all aspects of your time in government, but uh, I do think that there uh, was a uh, reason about loss of life that we settled for that policy, and I thought that then and I think that now. You alluded to it a couple of moments ago, but obviously the big crisis now affecting the world is potential pandemic. Some are looking at that very closely to decide when you start using that term of the coronavirus. This is a moment for for leadership, really. Are you seeing enough evidence of leadership on coronavirus here in the UK? I know you've only just literally yeah, landed. I've, I've, I've only just literally landed, but uh, my sense is uh, leaders around the world are trying to uh, take the best scientific advice, technical advice, and uh, do things that will uh, try and minimise the spread of the virus. I think this is a collective effort and sensible decisions are being made. It's a complex problem, you know. The sort of worst nightmare for a national leader, isn't it, a moment like this? This is the, this is the bit where... You sort of wake up at three in the morning, presumably, isn't it, wondering whether... Oh, I'm sure uh, from the World Health Organisation through many uh, national governments, uh, people are waking up at three o'clock in the morning. <laughs> I'm sure that's happening. Uh, but I'm sure at the same time that these are the sorts of eventualities that you do think about in advance. I mean, countries have had to address uh, other issues. For example, SARS was a uh, uh, potential, uh, particularly in our region of the world, in Australia. Um, there have been other times that health systems have been tested, there would be disaster uh, management plans that have already been war gamed and thought about. So in Australia, in the United Kingdom, in many countries uh, like us, I think there will be a very uh, sophisticated response. I think the thing that people would be most fearful of uh, is the virus uh, taking profound hold in countries that already have very poor health systems. Uh, we are fortunately, Australia and the United Kingdom, not in that situation. And, and has a direct impact on the sort of work that you've been campaigning so hard for too, presumably. Yes, that's right. So I think uh, many people are focused on uh, the virus's penetration into Africa, for example. Um, you know, already uh, in many parts of Africa, the health issues are such that they do keep children out of school, you know, poor nutrition, uh, all sorts of other health problems that are largely preventable and not known in our society. So yes, we do worry about that and educational continuity if the worst happens. Britain's obviously just taken this decision to leave the European Union. It's now in the process of working out what sort of relationship it's going to have, particularly with its nearest neighbours. Do you think Britain's place in the world has been diminished by Brexit? 
I think uh, for Britain now, it will define its place in the world. I know that uh, the government here is having what I think it's referring to as the biggest foreign policy review, <laughs> uh, integrated review across foreign policy and defence uh, since the end of the Cold War. Uh, I know what it's like as Prime Minister to undergo one of those exercises. When uh, I was there in Australia, we put together what we called the Australian Australia in the Asian Century policy paper, so a real look at our nation and our place in the world as Asia continues to rise. And it does tax your intellectual resources, your strategic thinking, uh, but it's very worth doing to define what you want your future to be. Yeah. Um, so yeah. I wish uh, the UK world sort of undergoes <laughs> that exercise. I wouldn't be surprised if no matter what else comes out of it, a lot of it leads you back to education. Yeah, it's interesting. I mean, you were asked about the chances of an Australian trade deal. Um, a, a few months ago, and you said, what I do know from my days as former Prime Minister is this, the UK is not in the sort of absolute top tier of our current trading relationships, obviously. China is, the US is. Negotiating a free trade agreement with the EU is going to be more of a priority for Australia than it is sorting something out with Britain, presumably. Well, I think, you know, all of those things will uh, play themselves out over coming months. Um, my focus really is not on any of that, but on the continued <laughs> engagement. Diplomatic. Uh, continued engagement for me in this capacity uh, as chair of the Global Partnership for Education. And obviously when I'm here in the UK, I focus very much on women's leadership too, yeah. uh, through my work at King's College. Yeah, we'll talk about that. We will get back to that. Would you like to see the UK back in the EU in your uh, time? Uh, uh, one thing <laughs> I know for sure uh, is people don't particularly like uh, politicians <laughs> coming from the outside, let alone retired politicians, and telling them what decisions to make for their country. So um, I was born here in the United Kingdom. Indeed. I renounced my British citizenship in order to be eligible <laughs> to run for Australian <laughs> politics. So I'm not a voter here. I'll leave it to the voters here to work it out. OK, OK. Let's talk then about women in leadership. One thing I will ask you about UK politics, you must be looking at the Labour leadership contest here because the one thing the Labour Party has never managed here in the UK, unlike in Australia, is to get a female leader. Is it time? <laughs> uh, and once again, I'm going to avoid that question. Uh, the Australian Labor Party and British Labor Party are sort of sister political parties, uh, but that doesn't mean we get to pick each other's no, leaders. No, no, sure. Uh, so but you know what it brings to a party, presumably. Yeah, look, I, I, I'd broaden the, the, the lens a little bit and say I was uh, here last year in the run-up to the election campaign uh, when so many women who were really uh, mid-career, women who could have gone on further in politics, uh, announced that they were leaving and many of them did cite the reason that they didn't contest last year's election was the degree of abuse on social media and their concern uh, that those threats would not just stay online but they would translate into the real world, that there would be a threat to their physical safety. Uh, and when I saw that, I became very anxious about what that might mean for the gender composition of the UK Parliament. And yet what we've seen is that there are more women in this Parliament than ever before. Nowhere near half, but more than there used to be. And I think that gives me some optimism. But what we've still got to be talking about is how can we make sure that politics for women is you know, it's ne it's never going to be a gentle profession. I mean, ultimately, people are standing up for ideas. There will be clashes of values. There will be hard debates about policy. But it's not an area where women are the subject of uh, unique streams of abuse. And I do think that that is happening at the moment, particularly online. So if we want to see more women come through, more women leaders, then I do think we have to address the toxicity in the online environment. Do you think we are about to get a female Labour leader. Uh, I'm not, not. I'm not running any oh, the opinion <laughs> polls, so uh, I don't know. I don't. I don't have any more idea than uh, anybody reading the what, newspapers. But what would a female leader bring to the current political scene here? Do you think? Well, I don't actually think. Uh, even though, you know, I'm sitting here as the first woman to be prime minister in Australia, I have never thought about gender and politics as being about the one woman. Uh, it is about the equality 
uh, across all of the structures and you only end up uh, with a more gender equal kind of politics if you've got more women in the parliament, more women in the cabinet, then that ultimately means you'll have more women come through for leadership. And that does make a difference. You know, I'd, if you believe, as I do, that merit is equally distributed between the sexes, then why don't you want your best team on the field? And whilst, of course, it would be possible for a man to go into politics and say that his big thing is, you know, women's reproductive rights or his big thing is combating domestic violence, uh, experience tells us that it is more likely to be women who put those issues onto the public agenda and push for them. Um, you've announced that you're about to publish a book on women's leadership too. You've obviously spoken to some standout figures on it, uh, Hillary Clinton, Christine Lagarde, Theresa May, who had very similar sort of setup really when she was leader of minority government um, and all of the difficulties and challenges that that can bring. Um, but actually, things f can feel like they're going backwards. You look across the piece now, whether it's... Donald Trump, whether it's Vladimir Putin, whether it's Viktor Orban, there's this great sort of recent trend for strong man politics, where these these great moments mm. when we got female leadership of all political hues coming forward seems to have been rather overshadowed. How on earth do you reverse that trend? Uh, on the book, I'm co-authoring it with an African friend of mine, Ngozi Conjury wheeler so it's taking a truly global perspective. I see the forces of reaction, definitely, uh, but I think that big societal changes only actually happen when you're campaigning for change that inevitably brings a bit of a backlash, the argument continues. We talk about waves of feminism. I use the terminology waves of feminism, but actually I think the wave um, is not necessarily the best you know, metaphor, because it gives this sense that it somehow just crashes and washes through. Actually, the history of change has been that uh, women and male supporters push for change, there's pushback, there's more, you know, as you go forward and ultimately the right decision is taken. Uh, so I think we'll get there, but we are seeing a backlash at the moment. I mean, it's interesting that women are finding sort of political strength outside conventional politics. Look at Greta Thunberg, look at Malala. It's almost as if there's a, there is another way. You're finding it yourself in the time since you left frontline politics in Australia. Yeah, there's not um, one way of making a contribution to strengthening or changing your nation or your world, uh, but I am a big advocate for politics. I uh, get asked often by young women, you know, clearly there's still a gendered bit, you know, should I do it, should I be thinking about it? And I always say, go for it. You know, I don't try and insult people's intelligence by pretending there's no gendered bit. There still is a gendered bit. But women who have got a passion for changing their societies or their world, I do want to say to them there's no better way of doing that than becoming involved as a parliamentarian. So hopefully some of the young women you talk about there end up uh, in politics and we see parliaments that are half-half and we see women prime ministers so frequently no one bothers to keep count anymore as to whether they're the first, second, third, fourth or fifth because there have just been so many. There's no point keeping the count. Um, of course, our sort of standout female figure in the United Kingdom is um, the Queen herself. You said a few years ago that after um, the, the monarch dies, that Australia should move to be a republic. Would you stand by that? The Queen has had an absolutely terrible 12 months. Um, I just wonder what your reflections are on having said that. Uh, well, I am uh, full of respect uh, for the Queen. I've had the opportunity to meet her when I was Prime Minister. I think she's an amazing figure uh, and her command of um, you know, events, having lived personally through so much of the history that shaped our world, she is truly a unique figure. Uh, but I do believe that Australia should be a republic. Uh, I you know, we had a Republican referendum quite a long time back and it wasn't carried, uh, a plebiscite to test community views. 
And I do think the next natural moment for Australia to, to return to that discussion uh, is, you know, when there is a change of monarch. Uh, now, given uh, the Queen seems to be made of very sturdy stuff, <laughs> uh, that may well be many, many years away. Uh, but when over, whenever the moment comes, then I think there will be a moment of reflection here in the United Kingdom. I think there will be a moment of reflection in Australia too. Gosh, that's interesting. You think it's as deep as that? that oh, no, I don't. I don't. Not, uh, not in terms of... Not yeah, having not the royal no, family. No, but, but it's interesting that, that you think it will seriously be a moment of reflection. Oh, I, I think, um, you know, for, uh, you know, people of uh, my age, for example, I was born in 1961. Uh, if my uh, parents hadn't migrated, uh, I would have lived all of my life um, under the current Queen. And so uh, when that is no longer the case, I think as an individual, you would reflect about what that means in the changing sweep of history. As a nation, I think the UK will reflect on what that means in the changing sweep of history, even as the next uh, Prince Charles is, uh, you know, there's a coronation and there's a move. Uh, in Australia, I think uh, that reflection will cause us to return to the debate about whether or not we should become a republic. You have the Duchess of Sussex on your panel for International Women's Day at your Global Institute for Women's Leadership. Are you surprised that she seems to have wanted to get out of the United Kingdom? Oh, look, I um, am not an expert uh, <laughs> in all of those uh, uh, royal uh, family sorts of uh, issues and discussions and the uh, conditions that come with being a working royal. Uh, but I found her on that International Women's Day panel to be a very thoughtful young woman um, who... Did you get any sense of the pressures that she was under? Oh, look, I, you know, I've only met her on, on two occasions, uh, one, <laughs> once on the panel, and uh, she seemed to me just a very, uh, very focused on women's empowerment, women's engagement, uh, and, you know, wanting to speak about those issues, and she did that very, very well. Do you wish they'd gone to Oz rather than Canada? <laughs> <laughs> All a question for them. <laughs> um, there's so much we could talk to you about, not least the climate change disaster that mm. your home country's been living through. I mean, just to, to recap on some of the work that you did uh, as you know, when you were in frontline politics, you pushed hard for a carbon pricing or carbon tax. It became very, very problematic for you um, politically. Um, do you wish you pushed harder? There was that moment then. Well, we did. Uh, we pushed we, as hard as you. Yeah, we we could have legislated done with the circumstances. Uh, uh, you know, no, we not only pushed, we succeeded. Uh, we legislated an, an economy-wide emissions trading scheme. Uh, and if you look at uh, Australia's carbon emissions, if you get a graph over time, you will see that they're basically up, 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 except for the period of our emissions trading scheme. And then when it was repealed by the incoming government, uh, they uh, the direction of travel, unfortunately, continues to be up. Uh, so, uh, you know, we do need change in Australia. Uh, I'm no longer involved directly in Australian politics, so that is for the current generation to sort through. It's uh, been nightmarish, though, hasn't it, for Australia in the last couple of months? Uh, yeah, it's, it, it was a very, very difficult summer. I mean, a, a, a tragic summer, loss of life, loss of human life, loss of animal life, loss of uh, so much of uh, our country, you know, places that are iconic. Um, in our imagination of ourselves and the international view of Australia, places like Kangaroo Island, uh, in my home state of South Australia, suffering so badly. So it's been an anxious, pressurised time. Just a couple of personal thoughts to, to finish with. You went back to your home, your birth town of Barry in South yes, Wales. Yes, I did. Last October. I mean, what was it like to suddenly go back and Julia Gillard to find her roots in that <laughs> uh, I've street? Had, <laughs> I've had the opportunity to go back back uh, to, to Barry and to be in Wales before, but there was something very special uh, about being there with the local leaders and standing outside the house I was born in. Uh, so I very much enjoyed that. And it's always um, great to be there talking to uh, people from the Welsh Assembly and the Welsh Government about how they're seeing things in the future for Wales. So I do feel a very strong 
continuing sense of connection. I was obviously a very small girl when we <laughs> left, but you know, I grew up in a household where the stories of Wales were constantly told and uh, all our relatives outside our immediate family were in Wales and we came and visited them. So it stays with me, strong, that sense strong of Welsh, Welsh heritage. Yes, we, we don't speak and no one in the family speaks <laughs> any Welsh, but um, uh, yeah, it does stay with me. Um, and one thing that we always ask people um, when they come to sit on this sofa and we get great and fascinating women to talk to is the three women that you would have round your dinner table if you could choose. I'm always fascinated to see who chooses. Which woman for what reason? <laughs> uh, well, uh, you've already mentioned one of them, which is I'd certainly uh, welcome Malala around the dinner table. Uh, she's been a fantastic advocate for the Global Partnership for Education and Education generally, and she's just such a remarkable young woman. Uh, I'd certainly like to see Jacinda Ardern, Prime Minister of New Zealand. <laughs> uh, she uh, too is a remarkable young woman. Uh, and I think uh, the way in which she showed leadership in such difficult times in New Zealand resonated around the world, as well as her status as being one of only two women who have actually had a child whilst in office. Uh, and then if I could uh, bring someone back from the past, uh, Millicent Fawcett, to remind us uh, that the suffragette struggle, which we now um, look back on, you know, who wouldn't agree with women having the vote? It just all seems so simple, so easy, doesn't it? But women had to fight for that. Women went to jail. They went on hunger strike. This was something that uh, needed all of their energy to push for. And so I'd like her to be there to remind us about what it is to really aspire for change and put yourself on the line to get it. Yeah, we've got a statue. At, at the very least, we've got that statue now in the middle of London. It must bring you great joy to see that too. Uh, yes, it does. Yes, it does. Julie Gillard, it's been lovely to talk to you. Thank you very much indeed uh, for giving us some of your time this afternoon. Thank you. Thank you.